Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the sleep and circadian rhythm section of the Brain Conference. I'm Dirk van Dijk. I'm a professor of sleep and physiology, director of a sleep center, and also a group leader at the UK Dementia Research Institute for Sleep and Circadian Disturbance. So you will understand that I think that if you want to understand the brain, you will have to understand sleep and circadian rhythms. And that's what this session is going to be about. When we talk about circadian rhythms, we think about rhythms, but what does it actually mean, a circadian rhythm? So our first speaker, Vicky Revel, is going to say a few things about how circadian biologists think about rhythms, how we can assess them in humans, and how we can analyze some of these data. The other presentations, which I will introduce when they will be screened, are going to be about methods to assess sleep how they associate with brain outcomes. And there are many different ways we can assess sleep uh, and the brain. We will hear about dream content. We will hear about brain temperature. We will hear about sleep microstructure, executive function, and many more things. So maybe we should start with the first uh, video, which is gonna be about assessment of circadian rhythms in humans by Vicky Revel. Good afternoon. My name is Victoria Revel and I am a senior lecturer in translational sleep and circadian physiology at the Surrey Sleep Research Centre and I'm also part of the UK Dementia Research Institute. And I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me to present to you today on methods of assessing diurnal and circadian rhythms in humans. I'd just like to begin by declaring my conflicts of interest. I'm currently funded by the MOD and Kent Fire and Rescue Service, and I'm a scientific advisor to the At the end of this presentation, I hope that you will be able to understand the difference between circadian and diurnal rhythms. You'll be able to describe methodology for assessing these rhythms, both in the laboratory and the real world. You'll be able to identify gold and silver standard and novel biomarkers of rhythms and you'll understand the value of longitudinal monitoring of diurnal rhythms to improve health outcomes. So we live in a rhythmic environment where predictable environmental changes occur at a regular interval. And the best example of that is our 24 hour day night cycle. But we also have rhythms in other environments. So for example, we have our monthly lunar cycles and we have seasonal changes that occur across the course of the year. To adapt to this rhythmic environment, we have evolved internal biological clocks that allow us to anticipate and prepare for predictable environmental changes, ensure that we are optimally synchronized with the environment and allow us to adapt to any changes in our environment. And today I'm going to be focusing on our circadian clock. So this comes from circadia about a day. So I'm going to be talking about our 24 hour rhythms. So why are we interested in measuring circadian and diurnal rhythms? Well, we have 24 hour variation in nearly all aspects of our physiology and behaviour. And as shown on the diagram on the right here, this ranges from our vasculature and our heart, through to our liver, our immune system, within our GI tract, and also our muscle function. And this variation alone is important when we think about personalised medicine. So, for example, the timing of diagnostics. So if you take a blood sample at 8 a.m. compared to 8 p.m., you may see a very different result because of changes that occur within your body across the course of the day. In addition, this could also be important for the timing of treatment. So you may have a more successful outcome if you give a treatment in the morning, perhaps compared to the evening. And indeed, this has been shown for a certain vaccination that morning um, vaccination may be more effective. Now, in addition to this variation in physiology, we also see variation in clinical symptoms and their severity. So for example, um, we see changes in the severity of symptoms of osteoarthritis, epileptic seizures, asthma attacks, and also myocardial infarctions across the course of the day. And this implies that the circadian system is involved in disease pathogenesis. We also know that circadian disruption occurs in a number of disease states where it may be an outcome, a driver, or a predictor of disease progression. And this does mean that circadian clock could be a target for intervention to either slow down the progression of a disease, or reduce the severity of symptoms, or improve quality of life. 
So the human circadian system itself is in fact um, a network of clocks. We have clocks everywhere. We know that within our brain, we have our suprachiasmatic nuclei, which is our master clock, which sits in the hypothalamus. And this receives environmental rhythmic signals, including the light dark cycle, to synchronize us to the external world. But we in fact have clocks in nearly all cells of our bodies. And for example, in our liver, in our lungs, in our hearts, in our kidneys. And within an organ, these clocks will all work locally together to synchronize their activity. But we also receive signals from our master clock, from the SCN, which ensures that there is appropriate synchronization between these organs and systems, but also with the external um, world. Now, within these cells, this clock is driven by molecular clockwork. And this is a negative transcriptional translational feedback loop where we have our clock and beam our transcription factors which drive transcription translation of cryptochrome and period, which then become phosphorylated and go back and switch off their own transcription. So here's our negative feedback loop. So I've mentioned circadian and diurnal, but what's the difference? And to try and explain this to you, I'm going to use this example on the right hand side of the screen. And what you're looking at is the sleep wake pattern of an individual and the black bars indicate when they're asleep and the dotted lines when they're active and awake. And if someone is in a 24 hour light dark cycle, you can see that we have 24 hour rhythms. Someone will be asleep when it's dark and active when it's awake. But if you take away that environmental cue and you put them in constant dark conditions, what you will see is that the clock will what we call free run. It will run at its own time. So for most people, the clock runs at slightly longer than 24 hours. And this is what you see here, is that each day this person is getting up um, a bit later and going to bed a bit later. They're drifting later and later in time. They are free running. And this is the actual speed of the underlying clock. If you put them back into a 24 um, light dark cycle, then you see they become entrained or synchronized again to a 24 hour day. When we talk about circadian rhythms, we are talking about internal time. We are talking about true endogenous rhythms, um, rhythms driven by a clock within us. And these rhythms persist in the absence of environmental and behavioral 24 hour cycles. It's our underlying physiology and behavior. Now in contrast, when we talk about diurnal rhythms, we're talking about rhythms in the real world. So rhythms that exist under these environmental and behavioral factors. So rhythms under a light dark cycle, sleep wake cycle, for a fed or fasted. So changes between the day and the night could simply be um, a response to being in light or dark or being awake or asleep. They could be exogenously driven. Alternatively, they can be endogenous rhythms, but they may be masked or influenced by these exogenous factors. And on the right hand side of the screen here, we're looking at an excellent example when we think about our core body temperature. So if we consider the blue trace first, what you can see is at night when this person goes to sleep, their core body temperature drops, reaches a minimum a couple of hours before they normally wake up and then rises when they're awake. So a true circadian rhythm. Now, if this person, if a person remains awake all night, which is what you see in the red trace, you can see that that rhythm does persist, but the temperature doesn't drop as low if the person remains awake. And you see this again here, if they sleep during the day, and the temperature drops from its normal um, level in the waking day because of sleep. So for body temperature, we have our underlying circadian rhythm, but it is masked by sleep. Translate this into the brain. We know that we have um, 24 hour rhythms in epileptic activity and seizure occurrence. And this is shown beautifully by the figure here where individuals were monitored over several weeks and we see clear rhythmicity in the occurrence of um, interictal epileptiform spike rate. And if we look at the periodogram, we see there's a clear 24 hour rhythm. But is this a truly circadian effect or is it driven by other factors? So to try and explain that, let's look at the um, figure on the right hand side of the screen, which comes from a study by Lyotel. And they looked at cortical excitability and they used TMS stimulation. And what happened here was that individuals were assessed across a 29 hour period during which they stayed awake in constant conditions. And what we can see is if we start at 11 a.m. in the morning, during the day, excitability increased. At the time when someone would, a couple of hours before they would normally go to bed, excitability decreases. 
Now remember these in individuals were kept awake all night and during this prolonged wakefulness you can see that there was an increase in excitability. So if we compare 11am after a night of being awake compared to 11am after a good night of sleep, you can see that there's an increase in the amount of excitability. So we have an underlying circadian rhythm in our excitability, which is modulated by sleep state. So now I'm going to talk to you about different protocols we can use in the laboratory to measure circadian rhythms. And here are the, um, are the labs that we have at Surrey. So here are our highly controlled individual bedrooms where we can control the light, temperature, they have sound attenuated, no access to the outside world. And here are our more living lab bedroom environments where again, it's a controlled environment. As you can see, it looks a little bit more inviting and also we have access to the outside world. So what do we use for markers of circadian rhythms? So the gold standard measures for several years have been the SCN driven rhythms of melatonin and cortisol and core body temperature. And you see beautiful examples of these here where we have rhythms of cortisol that peak just after waking, rhythms of melatonin that peak during the night, and core body temperature that peaks during the day and reaches the minimum during the night. And to obtain these beautiful rhythms requires that we take serial samples over several hours. And when we have these beautiful waveforms, we can look at different aspects. We can look at the amplitude or the strength of the rhythm, but we can also take um, specific um, features such as melatonin onset, the peak of the melatonin rhythm, and we can use those as what we call phase markers. So they can tell us the internal time of the clock. Now, more recent approaches have taken um, advantage of omics technology, so looking at the transcriptome and the metabolome. And the potential advantage of using these type of measures is that we may ultimately be able to reduce the amount of sampling we need to do. So at the moment, we take multiple samples over prolonged periods of time to get these beautiful waveforms. But if we take a single sample and take a multivariate approach, so we're comparing the levels of multiple different transcripts, this single sample may be able to tell us the internal time of an individual. So the first laboratory protocol that I'm going to talk to you about is the constant routine. And this requires participants to remain in constant conditions. And um, the purpose of this is to remove all masking factors to be able to look at our true underlying circadian rhythm. So participants stay in dim light, less than five lux, have hourly calorie controlled snacks, remain in a constant posture, and are kept continually awake. And this can be for up to 40 hours. And then we are able to do serial um, sampling. And on the right hand side here, you see an example of our body temperature rhythm and our cortisol rhythm under LD and sleep wake. And then someone who is going into constant wakefulness. And you can see that these rhythms beautifully persist. But as we can see, our body temperature rhythm, if someone isn't asleep, doesn't drop quite as much. Remember that masking that we talked about earlier. Another approach is false desynchrony. And this um, aims to distribute masking uniformly across the circadian cycle so that we can pull out those underlying rhythms. And individuals are maintained on a non 24 hour day. So in the example on the right here, we're looking at individuals who are kept on a 28 hour day. So you can see that each day the sleep period is delayed. The circadian clock cannot entrain to a 28 hour day and so it will free run, it will run at its own speed. And the advantage of this protocol is not only are we looking at underlying rhythms, but we can also look at the impact of sleeping in phase, so during the biological night, and out of phase during the biological day. This data is from Simon Archer um, back in 2014, and you can see that sleeping in phase in blue and out of phase in red, you can see a slight drift in the timing of our melatonin profiles. Here's our lovely cortisol rhythms. In our transcriptome, when we sleep in phase, you can see that we have clear day peaking rhythms and night peaking rhythms. But when we sleep out of phase, you can see utter disruption occurs within the transcriptome. Finally, in the lab, we can also put participants on a diurnal protocol so we can put them in a real world setting so they can live under a light dark cycle as shown here. They can have um, a sleep wake cycle. So here participants are awake during the day and they sleep at night. We can give them meals at regular times and they're also able to social interact. And one of our advantages of our labs 
is that we're able to take blood samples through the wall while participants are sleeping. So we're still able to sample across the 24 hour day without disrupting their sleep wake. The laboratory protocols have a number of advantages for measuring um, circadian rhythms. We can do short or medium term measurements, so days to weeks. It's a highly controlled environment, so we can pull out true endogenous rhythms and do intensive physiological monitoring and phenotyping. We can do serial measurements of different matrices, and we can also deliver and assess the efficacy of different interventions on the clock. It's an opportunity to identify novel circadian biomarkers and compare these to gold standard. And it also is an opportunity to look at rhythmicity in relevant clinical outcomes for specific diseases. Disadvantages of these protocols are they are incredibly staff intensive and time consuming, they're invasive, they're costly, and it's an artificial environment. It's not appropriate for longitudinal assessments up to days, months and years, and it's not appropriate for clinical or working populations. So how do we measure rhythms in the real world? So I'm going to give you a few examples, and probably the best known example is the rest activity cycle, um, which has also been used as a proxy for the sleep-wake cycle. We can also translate our melatonin rhythms into the real world using silver standard biomarkers, so using saliva sampling in the evening to get melatonin onset timing, and using the major urine room metabolite of melatonin, 6 alpha toxy melatonin, by doing 24-hour urine collections. We can look at heart rate and wrist temperature, and we can also look at environmental variables. By collecting clinical outcomes across the day, we can also look at how these and our clock um, are related in disease progression. And it's an opportunity, if we know someone's internal timing, to actually appropriately time and monitor the success of an intervention. So to monitor rest activity patterns, the most frequently used tool is um, a wrist wearable. So here we are looking at an ActiWatch, which has an accelerometer in it. So we're looking here at, you can see activity during the day and then lower activity during the night when the individual is asleep. And this is an excellent tool for long-term monitoring. It can be used in work environments, in clinical environments, and it's also good for looking at um, circadian rhythm sleep disorders where um, sleep wake may be at a different or unexpected timing. We also know that rest activity can be highly disturbed in different disease states. And I'm showing you here an example of someone who has a diagnosis of schizophrenia. So you can see this irregular activity, rest activity pattern. And here is someone who lives with dementia and you can see this is a highly fragmented rest activity pattern. So monitoring rest activity can be useful for looking at disease progression. It also may be a predictor of disease incidence and it could be used as a prognostication tool. So in addition to looking at the timing of rest and activity, we can also look at the stability of the rest activity between days, and also we can look at variation within a day, looking at the time when we have the highest and the lowest activity. Now, for someone who is living with dementia, wearing a wrist wearable for a long period of time may not be acceptable. And so one of the things that we've been working on is looking at new technology for monitoring sleep and circadian rhythms in the field. And here I'm showing you an example from an older individual who used an Acti watch and also used a sleep mattress analyzer. And this just pops under their mattress and can look at their bed occupancy, their respiration rate, their heart rate and their sleep state. And what you're looking at here, if you remember the actigram you saw before, so in the top and brown, we're looking at activity levels. And then in yellow and red, we're looking at the light levels. But then in red here, we're looking at bed occupancy. So we can also track when we have our major nocturnal sleep episodes. We can also track daytime naps. And you can see that this contactless passive device gives us an excellent indication of rest activity pattern and maybe more acceptable to certain clinical populations. Now, I mentioned we can also translate melatonin into the field. And here you see examples of 6 alpha toxy melatonin in urine. And you can see we have these beautiful 24 hour rhythms. Interestingly, what you see in figure C is an individual who is blind and has no perception of light. And so they're not in trains, they are free running. And if we look at their melatonin profile across the course of four weeks, you can see that each week the timing has got delayed as the person is free running. Now I mentioned that we can also take saliva samples and we can ask individuals for the four hours before bed to sit in a quiet, um, dimly lit environment, either using blue blocker glasses or using a nightlight. And every 30 minutes, we can ask them to provide a saliva sample. 
and we give them these track cap pots. So when they open them, this logs that a salivate has been removed. So we have the timing of the sample. And the study by Burgess et al. in 2015 showed a beautiful correlation between the dim light melatonin onset measured at home and the lab DILMO measured the subsequent day. So this is a very successful method to be used in the field. Finally, I just want to give you a couple of examples of where interventions can be delivered to try and improve sleep and improve circadian rhythms. So acquired brain injury is often associated with fatigue and sleep disturbance. And this recent study by Connolly et al gave a dynamic light intervention with blue enriched daytime light and blue depleted light prior to sleep. And they saw a significant reduction in sleep disturbance and insomnia. I already mentioned that sleep and circadian disturbances are prevalent in dementia. And this study by Bromont and Tal showed that if you provide a dawn and dusk light stimulation, this can substantially improve quality of life, mood, alertness and circadian stability. So if we know someone's underlying internal timing, then we can deliver such interventions, including light, and can have a profound effect on someone's quality of life. So to conclude, I hope I've been able to show you that increasing our understanding of the involvement of the circadian system in disease pathogenesis can ultimately improve health outcomes. Controlled laboratory studies can contribute to our understanding and allow validation of novel biomarkers. Rhythms in the real world may be truly circadian or they could be diurnal, but either way, longitudinally monitoring them could be highly valuable for monitoring disease progression, as well as delivering and assessing the success of interventions. And I'd like to end by acknowledging my mentor, Professor Dirk Jan Dyke, and thanking everyone else at the Surrey Sea Research Centre and Clinical Research Facility and our UK DRI funding. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, uh, Vicky, for this overview of methods for assessment of circadian rhythms in humans. It's easy for things to go up and down, but to measure it accurately and to interpret it in terms of is this a true endogenous rhythm or not, things are a little bit more uh, difficult. But I think that for the field and for the brain sciences, it is very important that, that we understand where rhythms come from and how important they are. And one reason why that is important, because if a rhythmic abnormality is a true circadian abnormality, you will look for a circadian solution. If it is simply caused by some kind of masking effect, mistimed sleep or what have you, you will probably look for other interventions. I see that there are no questions yet, and that's not surprising because your presentation was uh, very clear, uh, but maybe uh, one of the other speakers wants to ask a question uh, or does anyone want to make um, any comments? If not, um, maybe uh, we can go on to the next uh, presentation. So Vicky, uh, again, thank you uh, very much. Our next uh, presentation will be about sleep uh, and, and to be um, more precise, uh, what we're gonna hear about is association between sleep duration executive function and uh, brain structure. And this presentation will be by Xin Yu Tai, who is at the Nuffel Department of Clinical Neurosciences. Please. Hello, my name is Xin Yu, and I'm an academic clinical fellow with the Oxford Cognitive Neurology Group. Today, I'm gonna to talk about a project that we did last year looking at sleep duration, executive function, and brain structure. Now, I think we could all agree that sleep is extremely important for day-to-day -day life. The question that we sought to answer was how much sleep do we need for optimal brain health? More specifically, how does sleep duration relate with cognitive function as well as with brain structure? To answer this question, we looked at the UK Biobank, which is this prospective cohort of healthy individuals in the United Kingdom aged between 38 and 72 years. We looked at health data from over 470,000 individuals, as well as a neuroimaging subcohort of over 37,000 people who had a brain MRI scan. Health data that we looked at included daily sleep duration, which was our main variable of interest, other sleep characteristics, as well as other covariates such as genetic APOE status and vascular comorbidities, which could potentially affect cognitive function and brain structure. We calculated an executive function score for each individual based on their performance in up to five computer-based tasks of working memory and processing speed. 
So what did we find? We showed that both long and short sleep duration was associated with worse cognition. If you look at this heat map here, we've got sleep duration down the left and age at the bottom. The colors indicate their executive function score and the highest executive function score appears to be related to sleeping between six to eight hours. Now, unsurprisingly, age is a massive confounder whenever we look at cognition. So we can regress out the effect of age, and what we find is that a lower executive function score was associated with every hour of sleep around a seven hour peak. If we split the cohort into younger and older individuals, we find that the same relationship exists, and this suggests that sleep is just as important as we grow older. When looking at sleep and brain volume, we took a whole brain approach and we compared regional gray matter volume in individuals who slept between six to eight hours compared to those who slept other sleep durations. We showed that 46 out of these 139 brain regions were larger in those who slept between six to eight hours. We can zoom in on individual brain regions and we showed that some regions such as the orbital frontal cortex and the precentral gyrus showed a similar quadratic relationship as was seen with executive function. And other brain regions look to have a smaller volume only in those who slept longer. So we looked at many other interesting angles, but to end this data blitz, I'd just like to say that while we could not show a causal direction, we feel that the data suggests that there is an optimal sleep duration for both cognitive and brain health, and that sleep is related to a widespread structural brain network, which is larger than what previous studies have suggested. Thank you. Thank you, Xen, for that uh, presentation. Your data blitz certainly contained quite a few uh, data, uh, and it's wonderful to see how you make use of the, the UK Biobank uh, and look and, and show how important sleep is. Um, so let me see, uh, yes, I now see a question for Vicky, but that was the previous presentation, so we'll have to to skip that but maybe um i can ask you a question and so the the u-shaped associations or the inverted u-shaped associations we we see this not just for cognitive function but we also see this and i know you have seen this for other health outcomes do you want to see say a few more things about how the field and how you think about how this u-shaped uh, association may come about yeah, <clears throat> yeah, thanks very much. Um, now, I think we sort of briefly mentioned this earlier, but whenever I see a U shape function in biology, I tend to think that there are probably two processes going on. So, for example, in this particular instance, I would imagine that when there is a, a problem with the long sleepers, there is a different process when there is sort of lower executive function with the short sleepers. So, for example, long sleepers could have sleep fragmentation or other issues around there, around sleep efficiency. Where short sleepers, perhaps we're thinking about beta amyloid clearance or, or some other process is, is what I'm saying, rather than specifically those are correct. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for the explanation, you know, for that uh, phenomenon. Um, I don't see other questions in the uh, chat, so I think we're going to move on to the next presentation, which is again a longer uh, presentation. Uh, and the uh, third presentation is by uh, Gilles van der Wallen. Gilles van der Wallen is at the University uh, of Liège, uh, and he's going to talk about associations between sleep microstructure and Alzheimer's disease neuropathology in healthy, late, middle-aged individuals. Gilles, please start your video. So I report no conflict of interest today. So we all know that the brain gets uh, ch changes as we get older, and we all tend to show some signs of Alzheimer's disease neuropathology, one of them being aggregation of amyloid beta protein in plaques uh, that we couldn't quantify with PET scan, here on the left in a patient, and then on the right in a healthy participant. Another hallmarks of AD is the aggregation of toe protein in neurofibrillary tangles. You can see here the progression of um, toe NFT uh, aggregation. And of course, as we get older, we can we tend to show uh, some uh, neurodegeneration, mainly in the form of neurite loss and demyelinization. And of course, the reason 
Um, I'm here today. Um, it's oh, sorry, I forgot this slide. Um, uh, it's important to um, to remember that uh, these things happening in the brain take uh, place years or decades before uh, the onset of Alzheimer's disease uh, symptoms. And this relatively complicated figure just me is there to show that before you reach dementia or cognitive signs of Alzheimer's disease, many things are going on in the brain that can start um, years or decades before you start rising on this green curve here. And so you have what is called some preclinical uh, stage of or stages of Alzheimer's disease, or at least there is some sign of Alzheimer's disease neuropathology in otherwise healthy individuals. And so um, coming back to what I was saying before, the reason I'm here today is because uh, the literature is showing that there is a link between sleep and Alzheimer's disease and neuropathology. And if you disturb sleep, you will increase either toe or amyloid beta level in the CSF. And this may be related to the so-called lymphatic uh, system. And so if you sleep deprive individuals here over this red period, um, you and you make lumbar puncture at regular interval, you will see that there will be an increase in toe protein in the CSF in sleep deprived individuals as compared to a control condition where they were allowed to sleep. Likewise, if you uh, disturb sleep by producing sound and fragmenting sleep or uh, reducing the amount of slow waves during sleep, you will see an increase in amyloid beta protein in the CSF. And so this is the quantification of the amount of slow waves that you generate during sleep. And if you decrease this amount, this, if, if the, the difference is, is positive, then you have a, um, uh, an increase in amyloid beta uh, in the brain. And, and, and this is important because sleep changes as we get older. Um, and uh, this is just shown here with a hypnogram of a young individual who reaches deep sleep stages quite substantially during the night, while an older individual don't, doesn't reach these deep sleep stages uh, for so long or so often, and he or she will uh, wake up a lot more at night. And so there's a decreased quality of sleep as we get older. And this can be detected notably if you look at sleep slow waves, which you can see here um, as an example here, this slow uh, oscillation on an EEG trace, um, which um, um, are related to the need for sleep. And if you quantify this over the night, you see that you have more slow waves at the beginning of the night and less slow waves as you uh, you you continue go on in, in sleeping and you have much less slow waves if you are already if you're middle aged so if you're 60 to 6 to 50 40 to 60 years old as if you were a young individuals. And so this um, starts early in life and sleep quality decreases. And one of the things you can look at is sleep slow waves that decreases as you get older. Um, and uh, so I've showed you uh, that, of course, sleep changes, so it may impact Alzheimer's disease uh, hallmarks, amyloid beta and tau, but the other way is true as well, uh, the other way around, and lit the literature shows that if you look at um, uh, individuals with limited amount of amyloid beta in their brain compared to individuals with much more amyloid beta in their brain, and you quantify how much uh, slow waves they generate at night, um, you see that those with limited amount of amyloid beta will uh, have more slow waves at night compared to individuals with high uh, amount of an amyloid beta will slow much less slow wave at night. The same is true, although not with a, a, a so uh, clear figure and, and for toe protein. And here on the figure, you see uh, the red regions are showing a negative association between more toe protein accumulation and less uh, sleep slow waves at night. Importantly, this was shown in relatively old individuals and in sample size of 25 to 40 um, individuals. 
And in uh, our hand, uh, in a sample of younger individuals, despite the fact that we had uh, quite a, a larger sample, we couldn't replicate the association between um, amyloid beta burden, more amyloid beta burden, and, and slow wave uh, generation at night. So qualitatively speaking, we have the same uh, figure, but uh, uh, this was not significant. And so this, uh, may be due to the fact that we were looking at relatively younger individuals and overall contributes to the fact that maybe sleep is not fully accepted as a risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease because the, because the literature is not always fully congruent. And so uh, since we had individuals that were uh, younger in our hands, we wonder whether we had to look maybe at a finer structure of sleep, the so-called sleep microstructure, to find association between sleep and Alzheimer's disease. And so that's what we did in the two studies I'm about to present to you now. The first question was, um, uh, whether sleep fragmentation was related to Alzheimer's disease-related neuropathology. Why? Well, because, uh, and I've showed you this, um, the literature tells us that if you disrupt sleep, if you disrupt, disrupt slow waves and induce arousals during sleep, you have a link with amyloid beta concentration in the CSF. And if you have a sleep apnea, uh, it's a sleep disorder which is associated with sleep fragmentation, you also show an increased amyloid beta burden in the brain. Together with the fact that arousals during sleep are more prevalent uh, with aging um, and that they are considered to reflect poor sleep quality, uh, we wondered whether um, arousals um, as an index of sleep fragmentation would be related to Alzheimer's disease neuropathology. And so we recorded sleep, uh, normal sleep in 100 healthy subjects that were aged around 60 years old. And we quantified these features. These features are, are here displayed are arousals where you have a normal sleeping uh, EEG and then a sudden uh, increase uh, in uh, muscle tone, most often, not always, uh, but also uh, an acceleration of the EEG. And so you can quantify these things, and that's what we did. We also quantified amyloid beta burden using PET scans, and we characterize cognition with a relatively large test battery covering different cognitive domains. And so um, we didn't look at arousals just um, as uh, as a as a as a unique uh, ensemble, uh, but uh, we wondered if we um, would be able to find specific association with different types of arousals, because um, we um, uh, remembered that arousals may or may not be associated with changes in muscle tone as displayed here. And also, uh, arousals are tightly related to sleep micro macrostructure, sleep hypnogram, because they may be related to switches in sleep stages as uh, showed here. And so the first thing we, th we did is wondered whether uh, considering arousals with respect to the fact that they were inducing transition or an increase in muscle tone would um, be uh, associated with um, uh, significant differences in their uh, oscillatory composition. And that's in fact what we could find. Uh, it's a bit complicated, but here, but all it means is that if you look at different uh, type of oscillations in the EEG, um, you can find significant um, differences in um, their composition, um, uh, depending on whether they are associated with the T, so a transition in sleep stages, or with the M plus, meaning with the presence of an increase in muscle tone, or rather than the absence of increase in muscle tone. And so we focused on these four different types of arousals and wonder in these four different panels whether they would be associated with amyloid beta burden uh, in the brain. And we found two significant association. One was negative, meaning that the more uh, of these arousals, uh, the less amyloid beta in the brain. And these arousals were those that were not associated with the sleep stage transition. 
while other arousals that were associated with the sleep stage transition, T plus here, were associated with an increase in amyloid beta burden in the brain. And this was found uh, in a, in a um, well-controlled um, uh, statistical model um, in, as a triple interaction uh, between transition, muscle tone change and amyloid beta, uh, controlling for sex, age and, uh, and BMI. And so there seem to be different direction in the link between arousals and amyloid beta, depending on whether uh, these arousals are associated with sleep stage transition or not. We then looked at cognition and found that um, arousals that are not associated with the transition, so those that are associated with less amyloid beta, were uh, significantly related to a global uh, better performance in our sample, while those arousals that are not uh, that are associated with the transition T plus showed no significant uh, associations. And when we looked at the different domains, we found that the link with global cognition was in fact mainly driven by the attentional domain and the executive domain, while memory uh, performance was showing uh, no significant association with the number of arousals that were not leading to a transition in sleep stages. And so this uh, comes uh, brings me to my first summary, um, uh, where we first, I think, demonstrate that arousals are heterogeneous. Uh, and this is not a, the typical view uh, um, in the in the field so far. Arousals are um, mostly considered as a whole. And here we um, we found a way to separate arousals in different types. We're not the first ones to do that. Um, but we find that the way we uh, separated arousals in different types was related differently to amyloid beta and cognition. And so some arousals are associated with the sleep stage shift, while others are not. And these may be related to different brain mechanisms, but of course we have no mean to address these. Um, uh, we know based on the literature that strong arousals may be driven by the brainstem. And so these may be those that are, are associated with the uh, sleep state shift, while maybe uh, other arousals uh, not as, as strong or as prominent, which uh, may be more, uh, be more related to activity uh, only at the cortical level. This is very, very speculative, of course. In the second study, we wondered whether the coupling between spindles and slow waves could be related to Alzheimer's disease neuropathology. And so here, bear with me, we have to go into a bit of literature so that you fully understand what we tried to do here. Uh, if you look at an EEG and if you focus on a slow wave and if you zoom in, you'll often find that associated to a slow wave, there is a spindle. Um, and, and this is very zoomed in, and, and, the, and then this is not the actual representation, but it's just to give you a flavor um, of the fact that spindles, sleep spindles, and sleep slow waves are two features of sleep microstructure which are often happening together. And if the literature tells us that if you're getting older, you tend to have less slow waves and of slow amplitude as shown here, but the timing at which these spindles are occurring uh, is earlier compared when you get older as compared to when you get when you are younger. And in the very same study, the uh, researchers were able to show that the earlier you were having these spindles compared to the, the slow waves, the worse was your overnight memory uh, retention, particularly in older individuals, while if you were maintaining a later onset of spindles onto the, um, the slow waves, then you were having a better overnight memory retention. So the coupling between sleep spindles and slow waves seems to be important. So that's one piece of information. We then get aware of another study uh, which looked at the transition, the speed at which slow waves and neurons, in fact, the underlying neurons, go from the down to the up state during, um, uh, during a slow wave. And you, you can quantify the speed at which you go from here to here. And if you do that for all individual slow waves, 
you you see that although the overall frequency of slow waves seems to be relatively homogeneous, the transition frequency seems to show a double um, um, a distribution with some two Gaussians and um, uh, it wasn't a uniform distribution indicative of two populations of um, uh, sleep slow. Uh, some slow waves that were showing um, a uh, fast, uh, slow transition and others showing a faster transition. And what this recent study showed is that when you go from young to older age, you seem to lose preferentially the fast switcher slow waves. And so here again, the message is the coupling between spindle and slow waves is important and slow waves are not homogeneous. And if you characterize them according to their transition frequency, you see two populations and they are differentially affected by aging. And so we decided to focus on these aspects. And so we took the same 100 individuals, we detected slow switches, low waves, fast switches, low waves and spindles. We again have amyloid beta burden, and because the literature tells us that the coupling is very important for memory, we focused only on a memory test, which is called the um, MST test, uh, and which is very sensitive to subtle uh, cognitive decline in healthy older individuals. We then um, extracted and looked at how spindles were being anchored onto the slow waves. And these two graphs show, in fact, the same thing. They show that only uh, slow switcher slow waves in red have a preference preferential uh, timing for the onset of spindles. Uh, that's the density of onset of spindles onto the slow waves. And you see that only the red curve is showing a peak while the green curve is flat and here if you represent things on a on a circle with the phase of the onset of the slow waves you see that there is an increased density only in red while it's rather dispersed in green meaning that the um, slow switch to slow waves were showing a preferential anchoring of spindles um, while the fast uh, switches slow waves were not and so having shown this, we then looked at how they were associated with amyloid beta presence in the brain. This figure here shows you where we looked at amyloid beta presence. It's in the medial prefrontal cortex because it's important for sleep slow wave generation. And we did find a significant association, but only when we looked at slow switch to slow waves, where um, the earlier you were having a spindle, um, the more amyloid beta you had in the brain. If the spindles were occurring later on the slow waves, then you had less amyloid beta. Uh, and this was significant in a relatively complex model controlling for several uh, potential confounding factors. This was true for slow uh, switcher slow waves, but not for fast switcher slow waves. We of course also looked at the density of slow waves or the density of spindles and we couldn't find any relationship telling us that it's really the coupling of spindles onto a specific type of slow waves that is associated with amyloid beta burden. So you've seen that before, now that I've looked at amyloid beta, we then looked at performance to the memory test. And if we look at performance to the memory test at the same time of at the moment of the data acquisition for PET and uh, sleep recordings, we find no significant association. But luckily for us, we also decided to perform a longitudinal assessment after two years. And there we could find that the memory decline, so the overall decline in performance from T0 to T at two years, to performance at two years was significantly associated with the coupling between spindle and slow switch switcher slow waves, while it was not so when we looked at fast spindle slow wave. So this brings me to my second summary, which um, is that uh, spindles uh, show preferential encoring to fast switcher slow waves only, which are those that are better preserved in aging. 
we also show that spindle to fast switch to slow wave coupling is associated with early amyloid beta burden and that slow uh, spindle fast switch uh, fast switch to slow wave slow uh, sorry it's it's a mistake here it's slow switch to slow wave in both cases sorry slow switch to slow waves is associated with a memory decline um at uh two years um of uh, of time, uh, yeah. So, sorry, um, and so um, this I think tells us that sleep microstructure elements, which are essential to the memory functions of sleep, are associated with uh, Alzheimer's disease-related neuropathology elements and with memory decline. And this brings me to my concluding slides, uh, where I think I've shown you that sleep microstructure is associated with cognition. This is true for arousals uh, with attention executive function at the time of the recording. This is also true for the coupling between sleep spindle and sleep slow waves for the memory decline at two years. I showed you also that sleep microstructure is associated with early amyloid beta burden, uh, and this is true for uh, sleep arousals with positive and negative links depending on the impact of sleep continuity. It's also um, associated, uh, we showed that preserved spindle slow wave coupling means less amyloid beta. And because we find no link with what I call cruder measures of sleep, so the overall amount of slow wave or sleep make macrostructure or sleep staging, and because our individuals are relatively young, uh, uh, older participants, what we call the late middle age individuals between 50 and 70 years old, I think we provide compelling evidence that sleep microstructure is associated with Alzheimer's disease related brain features um, before or at a younger age than uh, slow wave sleep amounts or sleep macrostructure, for instance. And with that, I'll thank uh, all the people involved in the study at the University of Liège, and particularly Daphne, Maxime, and Justinas, but also uh, our collaborators in Montreal, and particularly Jean Marc, uh, Lina, and of course, uh, all the people um, involved, uh, all the people uh, involved, of course, but uh, sorry, uh, all the, the financial supports uh, that we get. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention and I'll, uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, uh, Jill. We often talk about how important sleep is for the brain, but then the question is which aspect of sleep? If you were to say genetics are important for the brain, you would ask the question, which genes? Uh, and sleep is such a complex phenotype that many features indeed could be related to aspects of brain function or decline um, thereof. Thank so thank you for reminding us uh, and showing this data. There is a question for you, uh, which is a kind of a, a technical question, I guess. Obviously you are interested in that spindle slow wave coupling but what happens to the spindles that are not associated with a slow wave or a slow wave that's not associated with a spindle? And so what exactly is coupling and when are things not coupling? Okay, yeah, so that, that's an excellent question. And, and it's true that you do have slow waves spindles, and you do have spindles without slow, slow waves. And it's actually the majority of both. Uh, we have a really substantial portion of congruent event, but I think it's roughly around 20 to 30% of spindles and slow waves are occurring together. And so we can only look at coupling when they are co-occurring. So we first detect slow waves, so we, did, we, we, we know where the slow wave is occurring, and then we set, we, we look for a spindle occurring in that time window. For the others, we can't consider coupling but what we did and what I showed in the results is that we looked at the density of slow waves, whether they were coupled to, to a spindle or not, or the density of a spindle, whether they were coupled to a slow wave or not, and we find no association. So it seems that it's when there, there, when there is a coupling and how the coupling is occurring, that's important, at least in our hand, in, in the data set we have. Thank you very much, uh, Gilles. It, I think we have a little bit of time and, and there are a few questions related to some of the previous uh, presentation. I, I think this question is for Xin um, and Sofia Tonioli says, you only showed CSF amyloid beta 40, but not 42 levels or their ratio. 
is is that what was in your slides uh, and and could you maybe comment on that i think that was the current uh the current oh, was it was that you uh sorry yeah, I, Jill. It, I, I mixed I think... up the two presentations Sorry, I, th I think it relates to the, the study I showed from uh, Jewett Al, oh, okay. uh, published in Brain, in fact, a few years ago. Um, well, I'm not responsible for the figure. I'm just showing what they reported. And so what they wanted to report is that the content of amyloid beta protein, whatever, whatever its form, was depending on how much slow waves you had uh, the preceding night. That's all they wanted to show there. Uh, so they, that, that's all they report. I could go up to the paper, but I don't have it on the top of my head as to whether they report M a beta 42. But what they wanted to show is that if even without waking up someone, if you disturb how they're generating their slow waves, and then you make lumbar puncture after that disturbed sleep, you have uh, more amyloid beta in the CSF as what you would normally have, let's say the day before when sleep was not disturbed. Thank you. So there is another question, and I, I won't guess for whom this question is. Uh, I'm sure that the speakers will know. Maybe it's actually quite a general question. So, and, and that's a question about how reversible are sleep disturbance-related changes? And, you know, would amyloid levels return to normal if, and this is the example, shift were to refer to daytime working? Uh, I'm not sure whether anyone knows about interventional studies that have shown a reversal of sleep disturbances leading to any improvement of amyloid or cognition? I'll take that one again, but I'm happy to let someone else uh, intervene. Um, the issue with amyloid beta is that once it's aggregated into plaques, and so the protein are really compacted together, I don't think there's any way to remove them off the brain. And if you do, I think it's in fact, it, it, does, it, it is possible, then there is damage to the brain, and so there's not much you can do. Um, but if you sleep bad, and maybe you have more amyloid to more morning, but then if you sleep well the next day, you may go back to a normal level. Um, then how it, that fits with shift work, I'm not sure we know. Uh, and so would there be a positive impact? I'm sure there is a positive impact in stopping shift work. With that concern, amyloid beta, uh, I can tell. I cannot, I, I don't know. There are studies that show that if if you stop shift work a long time ago, your cognitive deterioration may reverse. That, that's certainly uh, true. Uh, I okay, guess what the, what the field is re waiting for are interventional um, studies. Now, there's another question from Keith uh, Wofford. Uh, he says, thanks for the great talk. Do you think that fast switching slow waves and slow switch slow waves have different functions? Yes, I I, I think so. So there's a um, in the literature, it, people have been talking a lot about slow oscillation and then delta rhythm, uh, and so they put they placed on the cutoff at around one hertz, um, and uh, like I think Steria made a lot of work a lot of work on on, on these. And, could show that they were not uh, ha having coming from the same origin in, in the brain. There were some peculiarities of these. And so here it's another way of segregating slow waves in two populations. And we do at least see association with some aspects of the aging brain and cognition. So they're not doing the same thing, or at least not the same thing to the same extent. Uh, of course, uh, maybe if we if we had had a thousand subjects, we would have seen an association with both fast and slow switches, slow waves, and cognition, cognition and amyloid beta. The link seems to be most prominent with slow switch, uh, slow waves. And so, uh, although I don't have, um, don't know of any empirical data showing it, I would suggest that. Um, the same way as we see slow oscillation and delta part, delta waves uh, differently, I would think that it corresponds roughly to this different in, in switch uh, speed in slow waves. Yeah, I was going to ask you a question about that, but we have run out of time. But it's it's pretty clear that if you look at the slow wave field, terminology becomes complex. We have slow yeah. oscillations, we have delta oscillations, 
we have type one slow waves, we have type two slow waves, and now we have slow and fast switching um, slow waves. I'm, I'm sure that at one point it will be clear what it all uh, means, but we don't have time uh, for this now. We have to go out over to our next yeah, thank you. Uh, data blitz. And uh, Abidemi Otaku is going to talk about dream content content predicts motor and cognitive decline in Parkinson disease. Just asking people what they dream about is another way to get some useful information about the brain. Let's listen. I'm going to be presenting a study that I carried out towards the end of last year and published in Movement Disorders Clinical Practice, which aimed to investigate whether dreaming, specifically dream content changes, or linked to faster disease progression in Parkinson's disease. To do this, I used a publicly available data set, PPMI, or Parkinson's Progression Marks Initiative, which included over 200 patients who were newly diagnosed and underwent an extensive battery of clinical assessments and questionnaires, both at baseline and after five years. Among the questionnaires was the REM sleep behavior disorder screening questionnaire of which item two says, my dreams frequently have an aggressive or action-packed content, yes or no. Using responses to this item, I dichotomized the patients into two groups, Parkinson's with aggressive dreams and Parkinson's without aggressive dreams. And from this table, you can see that 58 patients at baseline reported aggressive dreams. And there are no differences for demographics clinical characteristics or disease severity between the two groups at year one. What I wanted to find out was whether there would be differences after five years. Specifically, I evaluated four outcomes, two for motor function and two for cognition. First, I looked at how many patients had progressed to moderate to severe Parkinson's after five years, honing in your stage three. Second, I calculated the average rates of motor symptom worsening and compared the differences between the two groups. For cognition, I looked at how many patients had developed dementia or mild cognitive impairments after five years. And finally, I calculated the average rate of cognitive decline and compared the differences between the two groups once more. For each of the four outcomes, the predictive variable was aggressive dreams and I used logistic regression for the categorical outcomes and linear regression with continuous outcomes. So what did I find? I found that after five years, patients with aggressive dreams were six times more likely to progress to moderate to severe Parkinson's. Their symptoms progressed approximately 30% faster in the motor domain, and they were more than twice as likely to develop dementia or mild cognitive impairment. And the cognition declined approximately 32 times faster. To make sure that these results weren't biased by unmeasured confounders, I carried out three sensitivity analyses, adjusting for baseline cognition, depression, anxiety, sleepness, and autonomic problems, and other sleep disorders. And I found that in each of the three sensitivity analyses, aggressive dreams remained a significant predictor of motor and cognitive decline. In summary, I conclude that Parkinson's patients who are newly diagnosed and report frequent aggressive dreams may be at higher risk of early motor and cognitive decline. I'm happy to answer any questions. I recognize that was a very quick overview. And I would highly recommend you read the full paper in Movement Disorders Clinical Practice. And you can send me an email too. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Abidemi, for this fascinating uh, data asking a simple question about dreams predicts a lot about what's happening five years um, later. So can I ask you a question? Um, how does your predictor, I think you, know, you, you mentioned the number of six times more likely, 
how does that compare to other predictors? I know that you know Ramsley behavior disorder obviously is a very strong uh, predictor, but could you could you say something about that? I think you're muted. So, in terms of predictors of Parkinson's progression, there are a handful of predictors that can predict motor decline. There are a handful that can predict cognitive decline, but there are very few that predict both. So dream content seems to be unique in that respect, but also the magnitude of the association. So there's some depression, for example, and REM sleep behavior disorder, which is certain sleep problem, tends to predict cognition, um, but the effect sizes tend to be twofold, threefold, but sixfold seems to be quite unique. And, and there is a, a question in, in, the, in the chat, uh, which in, indeed is about the, the association with uh, Ramsley behavior disorder diagnosis before PD diagnosis. May, maybe you have mentioned it, but did some of these people have Ramsley behavior disorder? So some of them most likely will have, but we con I controlled that in the study by asking them questions about dream enactment behaviors. And in one of the models, I included that as a covariate. So patients who had aggressive dreams, whether or not they had symptoms of REM sleep behavior disorder, they still had worse decline. Okay, well, well, thank you very much. I mean, this this certainly is is fascinating, and you know, I I, I would hope that many of us are going to include extensive dream questionnaires in um, many of their studies. Uh, we're going to move on to to the next and last presentation, uh, which is from Nina Vuzorek. I asked her how to pronounce her name and she reassured me that she herself wasn't absolutely sure. So I, I hope she's not insulted uh, by this, uh, but I do apologize. Um, Nina is currently at the Laboratory for Molecular Biology in Cambridge. And she's, she's gonna talk about uh, brain temperature uh, in humans and a new approach to assess uh, brain temperature in different brain regions. Nina, please go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Today I'll be sharing our work on brain temperature variation and its clinical utility. These are our disclosures and the authors declare no competing interests. We measure lots of things in patients. And for almost all of these things, we are comparing our patient data to reference data from healthy individuals. The most basic competency of medicine is being able to distinguish normal from abnormal. Abnormal temperature has been recognized as a sign of disease for more than two millennia. Human body temperature has been measured extensively, and we now recognize that both the temporal and spatial dynamics of temperature contain additional diagnostic information as observed with disrupted circadian rhythms and local warming at sites of injury or infection. Measuring things from the brain, however, is difficult, and brain temperature is rarely measured directly. Our understanding of human brain temperature essentially rests on studies of brain injured patients, where intracranial probes allow precise and direct measurement from a single brain locus. Aside from the fact that these are not normal brains, the clinical relevance of these data is obscured entirely by the lack of a comprehensive reference data set. This is just one reason why the use of targeted temperature management in neurocritical care remains controversial. In health, brain temperature is widely thought to match the body core. The temperature dependence of neuronal function has also perpetuated the assumption that brain temperature remains constant but earlier observations from healthy non-human primates suggest not only that brain temperature is higher than body temperature, but that it shows significant spatiotemporal variation. We set out to answer a very basic question. What is the temperature of the human brain? For this, we took a two-armed complementary approach, including retrospective analysis of brain temperature measured directly in patients with traumatic brain injury, and a prospective study of brain temperature measured non-invasively in healthy adults using magnetic resonance spectroscopy. 
First, we screen data for all patients recruited to the Centre TBI high resolution ICU substudy. Only patients with direct brain temperature measurements and without targeted temperature management were included. Additional criteria were specified for extended time based analyses and clinical correlations. In 114 patients, mean brain temperature exceeded body temperature and ranged from 32.6 to 42.3 degrees Celsius. Of 100 patients eligible for brain temperature rhythm analysis, only 25 of them displayed a daily rhythm and temperature. And the temperature maxima and minima were distributed around the clock in TBI patients. And this was in stark contrast to rectal temperature data from healthy subjects, where body temperature peaks in the afternoon and troughs in the early hours of the morning, as you can see on the right here. We also noted that brain temperature range decreased with age, suggesting a reduced variability in older patients. Currently, in practice, some patients undergo interventions to achieve a normal brain temperature. And yet the normal range of human brain temperature is unknown. We sought to test the clinical value of brain temperature in patients by establishing how much brain temperature varies in health. To do this, we recruited 40 healthy adults aged 20 to 40 years for brain imaging. We had equal numbers of males and females and representation of brains from at least five continents, even though this was a single site study in Edinburgh. Participants were scanned in the morning, afternoon and late evening of a single day, immediately after one week of actigraphy. Crucially, these wrist-worn activity monitors allowed us to control for differences in chronotype, or in other words, how an individual's body clock aligns with the day-night cycle. Chronotype control was important because the scanning times were fixed at 9 a.m., 4 p.m. and 11 p.m. And if you consider how temperature might vary diurnally in a morning lark versus a night owl, you can see that at any given point in external time, the biological clock of these two individuals would be sitting at very different phases, which would of course affect the absolute temperatures measured. We used MRS to measure brain temperature. MR thermometry exploits the fact that the resonance of protons in water is exquisitely temperature sensitive relative to those of a reference metabolite, such as N-acetyl aspartate. And we use the chemical shift difference between these two molecules to estimate absolute brain temperature in each imaging voxel. We included 80 voxels in the cerebrum, and for analysis of regional differences, we grouped these voxels into four U-shaped superficial layers, with layer one closest to the superior sagittal sinus, and layers two and three having a white matter bias. We also included deep brain voxels in the right thalamus and hypothalamus, which houses the centers for both biological timing and thermoregulation. To explore how brain temperature varies, we applied a linear mixed modeling approach with fixed effects based on factors that are known to influence body temperature in humans and other mammals. Random effects for intercept and slope were included, allowing our participants to have different baseline temperatures and different changes in temperature over time. In healthy adults, mean brain temperature exceeded oral temperature, and at any given time point, it varied spatially by 2.4 degrees, with highest temperatures in the thalamus. Across the cohort and all time points, brain temperature ranged from 36.1 to 40.9 degrees Celsius. Notably, brain temperature increased with age, especially in deep brain regions. Brain temperature varied by time of day, being lowest at night in both males and females. However, it was generally 0.4 degrees higher in luteal females relative to follicular females and males. And this difference was exaggerated twofold in deep brain regions. The time of day variation was also particularly evident in deep brain regions with nearly a one degree drop by bedtime. 
And here you can see that the daily range of temperature was much greater in the hypothalamus compared to that observed with oral temperature measurements. Assuming that brain temperature would vary in a similar manner on consecutive days, we used our time-resolved MRS data to model how brain temperature would vary over a 48-hour period. The most surprising thing to note here is that the marked diurnal variation in deep brain regions in males. From our healthy data, we built Heatwave, the first four-dimensional map of human brain temperature. Here you'll see a loop of temperature transitions modeled at hourly resolution in the brains of luteal females compared to males. Note that in both cases, we get a substantial reduction in temperature at night, as might be expected during sleep, and as predicted from known diurnal rhythms in body temperature. Importantly, the data sets we collected from three time points across the day represent reference maps for interpreting human brain temperature at each of those time points. Since each data point in each map is an average of data from multiple individuals, it incorporates the range of ages, body mass indexes, and chronotypes expected for young healthy adults. These data collection points also cater for the times when most patients would present for neuroimaging in the non-acute setting. Now that we know what normal human brain temperature should be, and how much it should vary, what does this mean for patients? We went back to our TBI patient data set and asked what features of brain temperature were related to outcome. We used a generalized linear mixed model for logic binomial distribution of patient outcome, coded as death or survival, incorporating fixed effects and random effect for intercept. We found that aging by 10 years increased the odds of death 11-fold, and a warmer mean brain temperature was associated with survival, but absolute temperature maxima or minima did not predict outcome. Most strikingly, however, lack of a daily brain temperature rhythm increased the odds of death in intensive care 21-fold. Now, statistical models are helpful and can produce highly significant results, but let's look at the absolute numbers in real terms. 98 patients were included in our final outcome analysis. 21 of these died in ICU, and only one of those had a daily rhythm in brain temperature shown here in purple. By contrast, of the 77 patients who survived, 24 patients, or 31%, had a daily rhythm in brain temperature. In summary then, healthy human brain temperature is higher and varies more than previously assumed. Sex differences appear to be driven by menstrual cycle phase, and regional differences agree with predictions from thermodynamics and cerebrovascular anatomy. Age differences might reflect age-related changes in cerebrovascular function, and potentially a progressive impairment of brain cooling. And time of day differences fit very well with diurnal predictions. In TBI patients, brain temperature range may be increased but this does not predict mortality. Daily brain temperature rhythms are frequently absent and poorly aligned with external time. In our cohort, there was a positive association between mean brain temperature and survival. However, the strongest single predictor of survival in ICU was the presence of a daily rhythm in brain temperature. We conclude that daily rhythmic brain temperature variation, not absolute brain temperature, is one way in which human brain physiology may be distinguished from pathophysiology. What could this mean for clinical and basic research? Well, first of all, our TBI cohort was small and larger prospective studies are needed to validate our outcome results before any recommendations can be made to refine clinical care. Nonetheless, Heatwave provides the first comprehensive, spatially resolved description of normal human brain temperature at three clinically relevant time points. This is a rich reference data set for future studies in different age groups and different patient cohorts. And we'd be delighted to hear from anyone who's interested in exploring the diagnostic or prognostic utility of brain temperature variation, particularly for chronic brain disorders. 
Whilst providing excellent spatial resolution, sequential MR thermometry is impractical for routine use in most clinical settings. Since core body temperature is not a faithful proxy for brain temperature, our results highlight an urgent demand for cost-effective, non-invasive technologies that can capture longitudinal variations in brain temperature. Beyond clinical care, we feel the time is right to consider physiological brain temperature in the lab for both 2D and 3D culture systems. We've known for decades that neuronal function is very temperature sensitive with a relatively high Q10. Passive membrane properties, conduction velocity, synaptic transmission and neurotransmitter reuptake are all dependent on thermal conditions. The sum of these effects may dramatically change network activity, which in turn would influence metabolism and heat production within a given circuit. We know that temperature itself is an important timing cue for biological clocks at the cellular and whole organism level. And yet we know nothing about how changes in brain temperature interact with the molecular clockwork in brain cells outside of the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The dynamism of this interaction needs to be understood before we can infer a role for it in disease. Ultimately, we look forward to a future where temperature and time can advance our understanding of how the brain works. All of these findings are accepted in press and Heatwave is freely accessible and can be explored at the web page shown below. And I want to thank everyone involved in bringing this work to life, the Medical Research Council for funding our prospective study, Centre TBI and our collaborators in Edinburgh, Cambridge and beyond. And of course, none of this would be possible without our amazing volunteers who enthusiastically got into an MRI scanner three times in one day and always kept to time. Thank you for your attention and I'd like to invite any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Nina, for fascinating uh, data and, and a very clear presentation. Unfortunately, unfortunately, you know where this is going. Uh, we have run out of time so I, I i think and no no questions but but it's pretty clear that uh, your work and the work of the other speakers will lead to many follow-up studies and i hope uh, that many people will be inspired to pay attention to sleep circadian rhythms including uh, temperature uh, with that i would like to uh, really thank all the speakers i would also like to thank the organizers for um, allowing us to have this sleep and circadian rhythm section and um, everybody now should move to the poster session, uh, which I'm sure is going to be very interesting. Thank you very much.